Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. For those who aren't familiar with us, we are a nonpartisan think tank, as I mentioned, based in Philadelphia. Um, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about a region, the Caribbean, that has experienced some um, some um, interesting events over the last few days. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about Haiti and Cuba and the history of US involvement in the Caribbean. And I think these two countries in particular uh, have very different uh, relationships with US. So I think that's going to be very interesting. Here to uh, be our moderator today is our um, one of our senior fellows, uh, FPRI uh, Senior Fellow for our Eurasia Program. She's also a Templeton Fellow for Latin America, a uh, Dr. Barbara Fick, who is a U.S. Army Colonel who serves as the Director of the Americas Program and Faculty Instructor at the Department of National Security at the U.S. Army War College. Um, she's had a distinguished military career, and, but she also has a PhD in modern foreign languages and literature, a master's of arts in Spanish and Amer Latin American literature from the University of Tennessee, master of education from the University of Oklahoma, bachelor of arts in international affairs, Latin America studies from Lafayette College. Um, before I turn uh, turn the reins over to Barbara. I'd just like to remind you all that we will be taking your questions um, roughly halfway through the program. So put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, not the chat in the Q&A. If you forget to put them in the chat, we'll try to look for them there too, but uh, we'll be sure to look for them in the Q&A box. Um, we'll also be showing in the chat box um, some maps of the region uh, that you can use for your reference. Um, finally, before I turn it over to Barbara, I'd like to thank our supporters and members of FBRI. Uh, we cannot do these events without you. They're free to you, but they're not free to us. So if, if, you're, um, if you're watching this uh, webinar today, if you've enjoyed our events, if you uh, like our articles, and if you haven't been introduced to them yet, come to our website, www.fbri.org. Um, if you like what you're hearing and seeing from us, please do consider supporting us. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Barbara Fick. And one more thing before I do is a disclaimer, which any comments that, that uh, Dr. Fick makes are her own. They do not reflect the views of the US government, the US Department of Defense, the Army War College, or the US Army. Take it away, Barbara. Thank you, Raleigh, and good afternoon and welcome to our audience and our expert panelists. Um, I, I'd like to start out by just commenting, uh, the Caribbean is, is such a diverse region, 16 independent islands and uh, 18 overseas territories, and it includes some of the region's richest and poorest nations. So in our focus on the region, the United States' focus on the region through history has ranged pretty much from active intervention to apparent disinterest. The U.S. relation with the Caribbean is characterized by economic linkages, by cooperation on counter narcotics, and other security efforts. Funding in the Caribbean has mostly, in, in recent years, pretty much uh, focused on the security uh, related issues, disaster response and humanitarian issues, including health, uh, which is very important today. Today's event focuses, as Raleigh mentioned, on recent events in two countries in the Caribbean, uh, Cuba and Haiti. That these two countries present foreign policy uh, challenges and issues for us is nothing new. What is new perhaps is the level of internal crises each is facing. Cuba is experiencing its largest protest in decades and Haiti is struggling with forming a new government following the assassination of President Moise, uh, Jovenel Moise, and forgive my pronunciation of that. Uh, so what does this mean for US policy in the region, uh, which is, you know, since the 60s, policy towards Cuba has been mostly focused on isolating the, the Cuban government uh, through primarily economic sanctions. And in the last decade, we've certainly seen some 
ups and downs in, in that. Uh, we, we've been very focused on democracy and human rights. And Haiti has experienced decades of crises, crisis. Uh, millions of dollars in aid from both the US and the international community have poured into the island, but still the situation has continued to deteriorate to the point uh, where gangs challenge state security. Uh, some of those gangs are linked to politicians in power and, and, and the Haitian National Police have recently uh, been involved in human rights violations. Both countries are facing economic crises, some of it uh, from uh, as a result of the pandemic, or I should say exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, and COVID-19 is just another element on top of that. So today we have two accomplished experts uh, and scholars to give us a deeper look at what is really going on in each of these countries and what it means for us. Uh, so I'll, I'll start, I'll go alphabetically by country, Cuba. I'll, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Michael Bustamante. And Dr. Bustamante specializes in modern Cuba and Cuba America. He is the author of Memory Wars, Retrospective Politics in Revolution and Exile. Um, he also co-edited the Revolution from Within Cuba 1959 to 1980, published in 2019. And he earned his PhD, uh, master's and MA and master of philosophy in Latin American and Caribbean history from Yale University. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I won't go further, but very impressive uh, credentials and, and uh, many publications. Dr. Alyssa Goldstein, Sepinwell is our Haitian expert, and uh, she specializes in history, including French and Haitian revolutions, modern Haitian history, slavery and film, French colonialism, French Jewish history, history and video games, and the history of gen uh, gender. Uh, really, really diverse and interesting topics. Uh, her latest book, Slave Revolt on Screen, The Haitian Revolution in Film and Video Games, was just published in June 2021. Congratulations. And uh, she, her previous works include The Abbe Grégoire and the French Re Revolution, The Making of Modern Universalism, and Haitian History, New Perspectives. Um, I think uh, you can see her bio online. She has She's very, actry, very active in the field and serves on a number of advisory and editorial boards as well. With that, I will uh, ask each of you to give your take on recent events. So what, has, what exactly has happened and what is the state of play? Maybe just to open things up. Uh, we'll start out with um, Michael. Can you give us an, an idea of what's what's happened in Cuba? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks to the Foreign Policy Research Institute for the, the invitation. On July 11th, so a couple of weeks ago now, uh, Cuba saw something that it hadn't seen in 60 years, which were uh, ostensibly spontaneous and horizontally organized protests across the island. Um, the last time anything remotely like this occurred in Cuba, you'd have to go back to the early 1990s, 1994 in particular, when in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Union and all that that meant for Cuba's economy at that time, it meant a, a, a multi-sided crisis. You did see at least one sort of notable instance of street protest in the city of Havana. What was so unique about what happened on July 11th this year was that the protests didn't start in Cuba's capital and they didn't end there, right? They spread across something like 40 to 50 towns and cities across the island from the far Western part of the island to the far Eastern part of the island. Um, so really kind of unprecedented. And, and the protesters were, I think what was so interesting about it is that this is something that took seemed to take the government, not only the government by surprise, but organized elements of civil society and particularly Cuba's domestic opposition groups by surprise as well. They weren't the ones who sort of convened this. Um, it just kind of happened and it spread 
you know, via that, uh, you know, in a sort of a predictable 21st century way, in, in, in a sense, you know, somebody started live streaming the first protest in a place called San Antonio de los Baños, which is a small town on the outskirts of Havana. The live stream got picked up and people duplicated the example. Um, and the content of the protests, well, let, let me say something about, about the causes of the protests um, briefly. I mean, two weeks out, I think we're still in some sense dissecting this. I, there's certainly not one explanation, but I think most of us that have been following this agree to one degree or another that there's a composite series of factors and events that have kind of you know, reached this, brought us to this, this, this breaking point, if, if you will. Um, on the one hand, Cuba finds itself in the midst of its worst economic crisis in 30 years. That is the worst crisis since the post-Soviet economic crisis. That's so, that crisis itself has multiple causes from the economic implosion of close ally Venezuela to the sort of yo-yo of, of a policy of engagement from the United States to a policy of renewed and very intense sanctions on the part of the Trump administration to the Cuban government's own slowness to reform its own economic model along the very lines that they've said they're willing to do, right? Um, COVID, as 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 uh, Barbara mentioned has had a big effect. Uh, Cuba controlled the spread of the disease really well for most of 2020. Um, but since then, uh, the, the spread of the disease has, has gotten much worse. And in an economic sense for a country that depends on tourism as much as Cuba's economy does, not US tourism mostly because of US sanctions, but global tourism, you know, not having tourists come to the island for 18 months has been devastating, right? And that's on top of, as I said, an economic crisis that was already already looming. So there's been rolling blackouts, um, severe shortages of basic goods, um, over-the-counter medicines. The, the state has really invested all the money that they can in the COVID response, and that has led to a shortage of resources to produce things like antibiotics, right? Um, blood pressure medication, just kind of run-of-the-mill stuff that people need on a day-to-day -day basis. So the economic situation is clearly dire. And you did hear some of the protesters voicing their concerns about that and some of the things that they were shouting. But, you know, this has not just been an, a response to an economic situation, or at the very least, these economic grievances have certainly fed into a political critique of the Cuban state that I think has been building for, for some time. So the language of the protesters was really strident in that regard. It was down with the government. It was down with Miguel Diaz-Canel, the, the president, the, the head of state. Um, it was cries of freedom. Um, we can probably have a rich discussion about the diverse meanings of that word. And I think that's worth having. But uh, suffice it to say, and I'll just end this open comment here, these are unprecedented protests. They represent an unprecedented challenge to the Cuban government. The Cuban government has responded swiftly and harshly. It's unclear, therefore, sort of, you know, whether what happened on July 11th is going to be a one-off uh, or not. But certainly the circumstances that led to that, led to it, are, are not going away anytime soon. So I'll, I'll end my opening comment there. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, Alyssa, would you like to kind of do the same? Let us know what's what is going on in Haiti right now and, and, and kind of how it came about. Sure. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. And it's an honor to appear with Dr. Bustamante. So um, I'll give a little overview and then we can go deeper. So the, the main thing we're talking about is that on July 7th, in the early hours of the morning, the president of Haiti, Jovenel Moise, was assassinated. And I think that was a big shock for the world. It's not often that heads of state are assassinated, but if you had been paying attention in Haiti, I think it was not so shocking. When I heard the news early in the morning, my first thought was, oh, <laughs> someone killed him. Um, Haitians felt that he had been ruling past the end of his term since February the 7th. It was as if on January 21st, President Trump was still in the White House. There had been a lot of dissatisfaction. People were waiting for him to leave on February 7th, and he did not. Um, Haitians had been protesting his government for the last three years, especially. Uh, and there were protests about these stolen Petro Caribe funds. Dr. Bustamante uh, mentioned Venezuela. Venezuela also has uh, an effect in Haiti, uh, Venezuela had attempted to aid Haiti um, in exchange for this long historic relationship 
Haitians, when they got their independence in 1804, had then helped Latin American revolutionaries who were seeking to get independence from Spain. And that's something that the Bolivarian state remembered afterwards. So there's this historic relationship. So Venezuela had said it would sell fuel to Haiti below market value. The Haitian government could then sell it in Haiti. And the amount between what Venezuela was selling it to Haiti for and what it sold for would be money that could be used for development. Uh, and the Haitian government sent out glossy under the current party, which is called the PHTK, um, which in English means the bald headed Haitian party. And this is a charismatic party built around the candidate who was Martelli's, uh, who was Moise's predecessor, Michel Martelli, who is a kind of vulgar music star. How is he elected? I'm going to get to that. Um, not with the support of Haiti's population. Um, but under Martelli and then Moise, um, the PHTK seems to have been pocketing all of this money that it was supposed to be using for developing Haiti. Uh, you even have today still members of this government having the nerve to claim that they built all of these things that are pretend. Uh, Laurent Lamotte, who was the last prime minister, under Martelli just came out with a book crowing about his accomplishments. It apparently had fake blurbs from people like Noam Chomsky and others who said, I didn't blurb that, but talked about all of the wonderful things that he had done in Haiti that were make-believe. Anyway, in 2018, um, it started to become clear that this money had been stolen, the, the government had mismanaged the economy, and people started to turn out into the streets after a protest that began on social media when a filmmaker named uh, Gilbert Mirambo held up a sign in Creole that said, where did the Petro Caribe money go? And these protests continued. Um, more importantly, Haitians felt that the government did not represent them. As part of continuing foreign interference in Haiti, especially since President Aristide was removed from power, in 2004, um, and especially since the earthquake, there's this feeling among Haitians that the international community has imposed leaders on them. Um, and it's really been an exhausting last 10 years for Haitians. Um, Colonel Fick mentioned the aid money that supposedly goes to Haiti. Some of it is not. We have these reports where the American Red Cross raised all of this money, and most of the money went to salaries for foreign Red Cross workers and they built six houses. Um, so a lot of that happens on that end, but the aid sometimes is also used in ways that are harmful for Haitians. And I could go into that in more detail, um, but there was an election in, in 2011 while a lot of people were displaced and couldn't even vote. And the, the international community really pushed this and there were reports of fraud um, and even Ricardo Seitenfus, who was the OAS special representative to Haiti, he later has written about the horrible interference that he saw by his colleagues. Um, and he took the side of Haitians in saying that there was fraud and that this party was forced on them. The major party that Haitians like the most, Lavalas, was not permitted to run under pressure from the US Embassy, and I could get into that in the UN. Um, but Moise had never been popular. And so jumping ahead to July 7th, someone killed him. And I'll leave that there for now. OK, excellent. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, so where do we go from there? Um, you know, I, I think you both kind of got into some of the, the things that led up the causes what would be the implications for this? Or, or maybe actually before I even ask those questions, I have a few follow-ups for both of you. Um, Michael, you, you mentioned different meetings, meanings of freedom uh, in, in Cuba. And I thought that might be interesting uh, to perhaps compare if, if it applies, and, and it may not, Alyssa, to Haiti. Uh, this special relationship from the Haitian Revolution to the 
um, decolonization of, of other countries in Latin America or in the hemisphere. So I'll, I'll open it up to go ahead, Michael, first. Sure. Um, well, what I was referring to when I mentioned the, the possible multiple meanings or, or at least valences of the term freedom, I, I think it's it's very easy and, and not incorrect to see in the protests clear demands for a overly centralized state to get off the backs of citizenry in lots of different ways, economically, politically. Um, Cuba is, is a one party state that doesn't allow uh, open uh, electoral competition in the way that you know we typically think of uh, working in a, in a, in a democracy. Um, there have been an in increasing, I mean, it's important to mention that these protests didn't come out of nothing just in the sort of social and economic sense senses that I mentioned. They were also preceded by six to eight months of really quite pitched conflict between organized elements of Cuban civil society and the government. Um, and Cuban civil society is a diverse space. It is made up of folks on the one hand have you know kind of long been self-identified dissidents and opposition uh, activists to the government, folks who are often linked into, and this gets into the US involvement question, sources of democracy promotion funding that are appropriated by the US Congress. And there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing there. The US, the Cuban government accuses these groups therefore of being essentially mercenaries of US imperialism. And the groups say, well, you know, we have no other way to organize or gain support given the inability to, to do so under Cuban law, right? Um, but that's not the only sector of Cuban civil society. There are you know, more reformist elements in the last months. I think artists and intellectuals of different kinds have been particularly active demanding greater freedom of expression, expressing solidarity with opposition groups when they have been repressed, even when they don't necessarily themselves identify with all of the ideas of those opposition groups. So, so that, that pitched conflict, which is being seen more and more on social media, I think also fed into this climate um, in, in one way or another, um, but but you know so so clearly there's a kind of a demand for greater political freedoms, uh, un, unmistakable, right? Where I think uh, the conversation is getting perhaps a little bit simplified, or where perhaps there's a disconnect between some of the ways that the these demands are being echoed in the United States, and I would say in the Cuban certain parts of the Cuban American community in particular, is that I think people in uh, in, in Cuba are, are not just responding to wanting to have a kind of command economy get off their backs and sort of you know leap head first into free market um, orthodoxy either. The other thing that's happened in Cuba in, in la the last years is a, is a pretty significant stripping down of state capacity to provide the basic elements of the social welfare state that were the hallmarks of re revolutionary Cuba's achievements, healthcare, education, I mentioned that the healthcare system held up pretty well during most of the pandemic, and it did. Cuba was a success story compared to many, many places in the region, not just the Caribbean, but Latin America writ large. But when in the wake of uh, around the turn of this year and COVID started to get that much worse and the healthcare system started to be really kind of on the ropes, that's symbolically, I think, very, very damaging um, for, for the Cuban, Cuban state or the Cuban government. Um, so people have had subsidies reduced as well. Um, there, there, you know, there are greater inequalities in Cuba now than there ever have been. And the, and the Cuban government also went through a partial dollarization of its economy uh, over the last months to respond to some of the, the, some of the aspects of the economic crisis. They also went through a, effectively a devaluation. And, and though it's being done in the name of a continuity of the socialist project, it looks strangely like a devaluation or sort of a structural adjustment policy that you would associate with kind of a neoliberal approach to things, right? And so, so I think it is undecided, you know, if there is a day after the current Cuban government, I don't think, you know, there's, there's agreement on what that looks like. I don't think there's agreement on what the contours of a new social contract would be, right? So there, there may be, uh, you know, agreement among the protesters that they want greater political freedoms, greater uh, rights to free expression, but in terms of economic rights and responsibilities on the part of the state, um, I, I think there's a disconnect there between some of the ways that those issues are being talked about in the United States versus the complexities of, of how they play out on the ground. And, and I'll just try to make a connection here to, to Alyssa's area and, and country of expertise and, and to your comment, Barbara, about sort of the connections, direct and indirect, between Haiti and Cuba historically. Um, you know, C.L.R. James, the famous Caribbean intellectual, um, in a book 
uh, on the Haitian Revolution and sort of ended with a chapter on the Cuban Revolution, effectively kind of calling the Cuban Revolution, in a sense, a continuation of really a centuries long decolonization struggle. And whatever the outcomes of that have been, irrespective of place, I think for Cubans or many Cubans at least, it also is really important and it is central to their understanding of nationalism, the desire to be really independent, truly. And so the degree to which uh, Cuba's future gets enmeshed with the United States uh, is complicated for that national sentiment. The degree to which the protesters are receiving uh, support from outside uh, Cuba, that gets, that, that complicates that, that, that it, or, or it touches that nationalist nerve, if you will, and I think makes difficult a, con a conversation uh, around these issues. It presents us with sort of either or things that you have to condemn either sort of US aggression, which in many respects I do, I'm a long critic of the US embargo and US sanctions, um, or you have to condemn the Cuban government and you can't sort of criticize both at the same time. And that's a false choice that I think most Cubans in civil society that I know um, don't accept. And I don't think we, we, we should either. So I hope that answers the question somewhat. I think that's great and very nice uh, links to um, Alyssa. Uh, go ahead. Sure, so you invoked the Haitian revolution and I will try not to go on too long, but I think it's an important issue to talk about when we're talking about now, because there's a long history of the international community seeing Haiti as dangerous and wanting to control it. Um, Haiti um, was a colony of France. It was the richest colony in all of the Atlantic world. It produced much of the Atlantic world's sugar and coffee but it depended on brutalizing and back-breaking labor of um, Africans who had been kidnapped from their homes and brought to the new world. Um, and slavery was particularly brutal there. So in 1791, um, as the French were, it, it, it's good tactics, um, as, as Colonel Fick might agree, as the French were distracted by fighting amongst themselves during the French Revolution, in 1791, enslaved people planned a revolution. And to the world's surprise, they won. Haitian uh, enslaved people won their freedom. They tried to remain part of France um, with freedom, but Napoleon tried to re-enslave them in 1802. So in 1804, Haitians beat Napoleon's armies um, and declared independence under Jean-Jacques Dessalines. And you might think that in the United States, which had had its own revolution against its colonial power, that people said, good for them. Except race was of course a big issue in the United States then as now. And even though there were some people that we might call progressives back in the 18th century who said their revolution is just like ours, there were others who said, we need to stop those ends from giving an example to ours of the freedom that will await them if they kill their masters and mistresses. So there was a long effort to isolate, control, and punish Haiti. Um, Haiti got independence in 1804. Uh, the US did not want to recognize it. And I pulled up on my lap here, but I think I probably won't read uh, quotes from Congress people during debates in the 1820s and 1830s where they said, no, we can never acknowledge the independence of that country. That would be terrible for our peculiar institution. Um, in 1825, France finally recognized its former colony, but the price of this was something that would prove to be crushing for Haitians. Unlike after the Holocaust where the Germans paid victims for the suffering and loss of their families, it was the opposite. Fran said, you need to pay us back for the property you stole from us, meaning the land and themselves. And so that was 150 million francs. And that was, Haiti was like Libya, right? <laughs> Under Gaddafi, they were a pariah in that way. So the leader of Haiti in 1825 agreed to this kind of Faustian bargain to be reintegrated. But after that, this debt that had interest upon interest to pay was something that was crushing um, for Haitians to pay. And if I can just 
jump ahead to 1915. Today is July 29th. Yesterday was July 28th, which happens to be the anniversary of the U.S. invasion and the first U.S. occupation of Haiti, July 28th, 1915. Um, there, the pretext was the assassination of a president, but the U.S. already had warships that were anchored um, on Haiti's coast. For a long time, we, we have Guantanamo now, but the U.S. had wanted ports in Haiti. Um, and more importantly, there was concern that leaders in Haiti might use money for domestic spending and not for paying the debt to Citibank, um, the predecessor of Citibank. So I will tell you, if you want to go and look at the U.S. State Department website, you will see there that the State Department acknowledges today that even though the pretext was to create order in Haiti, that the real reason was to secure U.S. interests and also to keep the Germans out of Haiti. And um, so, yeah, I'll just say there's this long, I'll try to wrap up here and then we can go more, this long history of foreign interference um, in Haiti. And since then, there has always been the threat for Haitian leaders from 1915 to 1991, when Aristide was overthrown for the first time to 2004, that if a Haitian leader is not doing the bidding of the U.S. Embassy, that a limo will come or he will get shot in the middle of the night um, and that we will be able to control policy. So that's one of the main things that Haitians are upset about. They feel that they do not have genuine sovereignty um, and that the international community has been choosing their leaders. Okay, I'll stop there for now. These are excellent comments and, and I really love it. Um, I'm gonna ask one last follow-up question before we go to our Q&A because we've got some great questions in there uh, because both of you have really set this up. Where are we state of play? Um, it, the, and then the complicated history of the US and, and also just the histories in general, which sort of make it difficult. It's a complex problem now to define U.S. foreign policy or what it should be. What should the U.S. do, if anything, uh, in in the in view of recent events in Cuba, in Haiti? Uh, you say, what should foreign policy be, uh, or or are there opportunities uh, for U.S. better U.S. foreign policy or international community? I'll I'll try and open it up to make it fit both countries. <laughs> Is it okay if I jump in there because I'm already ready on this? The number one thing that Haitians want the U.S. to do is not to send new troops, as the Washington Post urged. Um, the history of foreign troops, not just the occupation, but the U.N. minister, which after the earthquake brought cholera, introduced cholera in Haiti, introduced suffering, and uh, there were lots of rapes. There are minister children, and the UN has taken no accountability. Haitians do not want another US intervention. What they want is for us to support Haitian civil society in having a transition away from this government. I will say that in the US government, there has been some support for this. Even though the Trump administration and then the Biden administration have been supporting the PHTK from the House, the Foreign Relations Committee and the House Haiti Caucus, which formed in May. There have been people pushing, Gregory Meeks, Andy Levin, Yvette Clark, Ayanna Presley, and Val Demings, even before the assassination, have been saying to the rest of our government, we need to support Haitian civil society to choose leaders who they feel are representative. And I will say that right now there is a commission. It's like a constitutional convention. It's people drawn from all parts of Haitian society, workers, churches, the diaspora, women's movement, and they have been meeting, but they have been getting no support. Ned Price, the State Department spokesperson declared, we wanna support civil society. And people have been saying, no, this is false. You have not even reached out to the commission. You've anointed Ariel Henry from this government that mandate should have ended instead of helping a transition. So that is, I'll stop there, what Haitians want. They, they have the knowledge. There are leaders who are ready 
to um, take power, but they want us to support them and not to uphold this PHTK government that they've wanted to get rid of. I'm just going to comment before we go to Michael. With without, uh, I don't, I don't think you have to answer because I'm not sure it is answerable. <laughs> is there one voice or one thing that the Haitians have unified behind that they want for the rest of the international community to support? That that may be one of our challenges. And think about that while we ask Michael to comment on this complexity that you have both laid out so well. Sure. Um... Before I address the implications for US policy, I, I indulge me, I just wanna make one remark that I think also connects both, both countries. And it is just to say that I think we need to be very critically conscious of sort of the, the frames through which we are almost conditioned, I think, to see both places. Um, Alyssa laid out very well and very convincingly that you know this scandalous assassination of a president was preceded by uh, you know months, if not years of actual, you know, civil society protests against uh, corruption, abuses, etc. Things that, you know, we could uh, very much or we should very much want to get on board with. Um, and, and yet I think there is still, because of precisely some of the long-term history that, that Alyssa was, was referencing, you know, when we think Haiti, we think unrest. And when we see Cubans in the streets, we think, you know, liberty, right? Um, I, I, think, I think there's, there's a way in which some of the long-term uh, narratives around Haiti that are kind of embedded in our national psyche and our international psyche, and also the long-term embeddedness of seeing Cuba through a Cold War lens. I mean, th those things are still with us, right? And what we have in both countries, it seems to me, are legitimate um, expressions of civic desire for change um, in one, one way or another. And I think we need to you know, treat both seriously uh, in the same way. And there's another linkage that I, I find very interesting. And, and you know, let me go back in the history a little bit too, because there's, there's a long history between Cuba of, of ties and conflict between Cuba and Haiti. After the Haitian revolution, um, you know, one, what, if, if the French were the losers of that, the Spanish were in a sense, the winners because a lot of the French plant planters, the biggest ones went to places like Cuba, not only to Cuba, but went to Cuba often bringing their enslaved with them. Um, and, and if uh, the colony of Saint-Domingue had been the largest producer of sugar before the Haitian revolution, when that all went away, all of a sudden Cuba and, and under Spanish control could step into the void. And so Cuba's most intense period of, of slavery is in the 19th century following the Haitian revolution. And throughout the 19th century, what, what troubles the minds of, uh, of Cubans, um, whether they're pro-independence from Spain or not, is this idea that we cannot become the next Haiti. And this fear of what it would mean to have popular classes and classes of color rise up against the powers that be, that's something that persists into the 20th century uh, in, in Cuba after Cuba becomes independent. And I think it still is, is relevant, that kind of fear, because one of the, the lines that you've heard the Cuban government say in response to these protests, they said, we are not gonna let anything damage our tranquility, right? And, and, and in that, as much as the Cuban government it positions itself as the expression of this deeper anti-colonial history in the region that led to things like the Haitian Revolution and then the Cuban Revolution, in that I see very curious echoes of a kind of a fear. We cannot be the next Haiti. That is the specter of unrest. And it's no mistake that these protests were coming out of poor, uh, uh, communities in, in Cuba who have been on the losing end of the economic reform processes that have happened and are, are there were uh, many, many Cubans of color, right? And the government language to call the protesters vulgar, uh, lumpen, which is an old Marxist term, right? These are, these, are these are terms that have clear class and race implications. Um, so there's interesting connections there. Quickly on, on US policy, because I know we're, we're short on time. Um, it's worth probably saying something about the yo-yo of sort of where we've been and where we are now. Many of you, if not all of you, will remember President Barack Obama sort of declaring a new era in relations between the United States and Cuba, saying we cannot impose our will on the Cuban people. Um, we need to engage the Cuban government and Cuban society. We need to facilitate connection, right? We can't get rid of the embargo ourselves out of the executive branch because only Congress can do it, but we're going to poke as many holes in it as possible. That was followed by a Trump administration that came in determined really largely for domestic political reasons, i.e. electoral reasons in South Florida, to say we're going to undo all of that. They follow through on that promise, particularly in 2019 and 2020. President Biden campaigned on certainly not 
um, going back to a full-throated embrace of what Obama's policy had been, but he did promise to unwind some of the more onerous sanctions that Trump had put in place, which made it more difficult for Cuban Americans to send money to their families, uh, to travel to the island, uh, more difficult for Americans in general to travel to the island, all of which have had real economic effects on Cuban uh, society and, and the Cuban people, not and have hurt Cuban people more than their government, I, I would argue. Um, but then these protests happen. And suddenly Biden having delayed six months or more doing anything on Cuba, saying it was not a priority. And they were just starting to give signs that maybe they were getting ready, ready to move on some of the stuff given how bad the humanitarian crisis is in Cuba. They're confronted with this protest movement. And so the politics of Biden now trying to unwind Trump era sanctions have just gotten a lot more complicated. Um, on the one hand, there is a desire on the part of the Biden administration to support the protesters. Um, they seem to be trying to thread a needle, though, that would allow them to, to undo some of those sanctions that have hurt Cuban citizens. But it's not easy because if the argument of sort of the isolation strategy is create a pressure cooker and then it pops in a society that rebels against its government, a lot of people are pointing to what happened on July 11th as evidence that it works and that now you can't unwind anything because that's going to just play into the Cuban government's hands and, and undermine the moves of the protesters. That's where I see a real disconnect between what the protesters were actually wanting, or at least a, a number of them were wanting, and what I, what a lot of the smartest voices in Cuban civil society are saying, which is that they don't see relief from U.S. sanctions and political change in their country as things that are conditional on one another. They don't see them as either ors. They see them as a both and. They acknowledge that the U.S. embargo hurts them, and they want change. And both of those things can happen simultaneously. I'll just end by saying one of the more distressing parts of this disconnect, and it connects back to what Alyssa was saying too, is that you have also heard calls, particularly from elements of the Cuban American community saying, we want military intervention. It's difficult right now to go around Miami uh, and not see cars that are sort of, you know, decked out with Cuban flags and kind of, um, you know, things written in shoe polish on windows, right? Intervención ahora, military intervention now. I think this comes out of a place of desperation, of wanting things to change, built up frustration. But there's also a legacy of U.S. military intervention occupation in Cuba. Uh, the, the, in my estimation, the, the longer that the United States remains the boogeyman in Cuba's internal politics, the, the, more, uh, the, the more that that creates obstacles for the change that most Cubans want and seek because it converts the Cuban thing into a US Cuban thing. And perhaps those are always impossible to separate as they have always been throughout the history of US Cuban relations. But um, I like to believe that, that it is possible to separate. And, and that's what I hear you know, many, many Cubans asking for. So I, I, I echo Alyssa's call, no military intervention in Haiti, no military intervention in, in, in Cuba, certainly in the Cuban case, it's not going to happen. Um, so, so the calls are just are just unrealistic, and they're irresponsible because they feed into the narrative that you hear coming out of Havana that the protests are just the result of an external subversion campaign, and and it's more complicated than that, uh, to say the least. Thank you both. Those were really great comments. We've got f a number of questions in the Q and A. Um, I think. Did, did you want me to jump in on that or wait um, on the one thing that Haitians want? Uh, let's close with that because I think right. that's awesome. Um, so the, the first question, um, and, and these are quick, I think you guys may have touched on, uh, how much of an impact has a, on the Cuban economy have U.S. sanctions had? Um, a lot. I mean, to, to, to one, of the, one of the more frustrating, at least for me, parts of the conversation of the last couple of weeks has been folks and I understand this, you know, saying this is not the time to talk about U.S. policy or U.S. sanctions. Let's let's focus on what Cuban people are are demanding. I I understand that and sympathize with that. There's a real world though in which the U.S. Cuba policy conversation is going to happen is happening anyway. So we might as well talk about it. And I think to deny that U.S. sanctions have had an impact in the Cuban economy is to be an ostrich with which our head with our head in the sand. Um, the State Department in a recent document admitted that these are the most comprehensive program of sanctions the United States imposes on any country period, or at least the most comprehensive program of sanctions that the Office of Foreign Assets Control enforces out of the Treasury Department. Um, they do not just impact bilateral relationships, right? Um, they impact you know, third country and international trade for Cuba. Insofar as international banks, as one example, are linked into US banks that sort of gums up the works with you know, financial relations, uh, credit, all, all kinds of things. So they, they absolutely have an impact. 
But that is not to say that there are not many things that the Cuban government can do to reform and improve its own economy. It is not only the United States' fault that, the Cuban, that Cuba, the largest island in the Caribbean, which should be a breadbasket of the region, is importing 70% of its food or the food that its people consume. I mean, that, that's crazy. And the government has been trying to fix that for 15 years and they've really not gotten very far. Um, so the, again, this is one of these uh, um, either or things. Um, there are obvious and direct ways in which U.S. sanctions hurt the Cuban economy, um, but there are many things that the, you know, Cuba does trade with other countries around the world, um, even if that trade is sometimes constrained and more difficult because of the third, the sort of third country effects of U.S. sanctions. Um, so this is not an either or. I'll just say that I think one of the things that has been particularly um, uh, frustrating or infuriating for, for Cubans on the island and particularly for, for the Cuban government is that, is that the United States in the midst of a global pandemic, first under Trump and so far under Biden, didn't at all wind back some of these sanctions. If I want to donate a truckload of syringes to help Cuba's vaccination campaign that's happening right now, I've got to ask for permission to do that. I mean, I need a, I need a license from the Department of Commerce. Well, you know, the, either administration could have very easily said, you know, let's just waive the licensing requirements for that kind of stuff, even if on a temporary basis, and they didn't. Right. So, so again, um, we need to think about how we do. Uh, we don't do harm to the Cuban people through our foreign policy. Uh, at the same time that we listen to what Cuban people are demanding of their own government. I think that's great. We'll jump back to Alyssa. And Alyssa, there we have a question here in the Q and A that will kind of. I'm going to combine with you answering my last question. Uh, and and the question, uh, I think you you've touched on it, but. And it's similar to what, what you just mentioned, Michael, about Cuba, but are all of Haiti's problems caused by external forces? So combine that with the other question, if you can. That is a wonderful question. And I will recommend also my second book, um, Haitian History, New Perspectives, in which I look at the combination of external and internal forces. But we can't separate them because if we're gonna talk about something like the Duvalier regime, which was very horrible to its people. We need to realize that the US propped up the Duvalier regime and prevented people from overthrowing them. Why? Now I'll, 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 I'll gesture to Cuba now because we didn't want another Castro. And so again, you have this intervention that makes or breaks who is the leader in Haiti because of our interests? And this is a Cold War theme that you all should know well. It doesn't matter if a leader was awful to their people, if they were anti-communist or said that they were, then we helped arm them against their people. And so I'll come back again. That is something that Haitians don't want, right? Haitians would like the opportunity to mess up themselves, then we can say, look at you messing up yourselves. But the problem is that the meddling is nonstop. Um, and again, if you think about in Philadelphia, you might have problems with the city and you might uh, want a different mayor, but if it doesn't matter who you vote for, or if the mayor helps you, and then you know that the Russians are going to topple that mayor, it doesn't matter. And so all of these decisions for Haiti are made from outside. Haitians wanted a minimum wage law. They elected President Aristide Lavalas to help create, um, to, to help deconstruct the extreme wealth inequality that we have helped perpetuate by propping up certain elites. You have a very small number of very wealthy families in Haiti, and then the rest of the people who are living in misery. Haitians have tried to change that when they've been permitted to go to the polls um, in the few free elections, but US business interests did not like the idea of paying even more than say $5 a day to bring it up to $6 a day. And so there was tremendous pressure um, pushing the State Department to um, press the Haitian government to cancel these. And the problem is, right, we want stability. There's a, there's, a, I mean the US, the idea is that stability in Haiti is good for us so that there won't be a surge. I will say personally, I think that Haitian immigrants are wonderful. They've been helping us in the pandemic. 
as uh, nurses, doctors, and scientists. But they're, for people who don't want to see a surge of people, having stability in Haiti and having people not have to flee a government that we are arming against people um, for short-term stability, which is no protests, but long-term turmoil, um, we, we should want to support the aspirations of the Haitian people so that people can live there and be happy. But too often, the people who are pushing the State Department are the small number of people paying attention to Haiti, and that is American manufacturers in Haiti and not the rest of us. So that's certainly one thing that I try to talk about is that it's important that people are aware um, of what we are Doing. So yes, what people want us to do is stop meddling and stop arming governments that they didn't vote for against us. And I think that this current commission of civil um, Haitian civil society um, is something that would be worth our supporting. Excellent. Uh, we've got a number of questions and I think we can actually get to them. One that applies to both Cuba and Haiti, and I'm going to ask them both up front. Uh, and it, it is uh, references a, a paper by John Green in summer 2021 issue of Political Science Quarterly, does race stop at the water's edge, elites, the public, and support for foreign intervention among white citizens over time. The question, though, is, is there a racial dynamic to current political strains in the U.S. dialogue, in the U.S. dialogue, regarding both Cuba and uh, Haiti? Is, is, is the racial dynamic affecting our conversation in probably in the political policy circles. So question on that. Uh, the other one, there's a couple of questions on the diaspora. So what what influence does do, do the for the different countries does the diaspora in the United States have on internal events in those countries? And uh, Last would be a comment, which I'll try and summarize, uh, basically emphasizing that the kind of change needed in, in uh, a country like Haiti in particular, and this is someone with a lot of experience in the region, including Haiti, is education. Education, education. I would say that applies to our country as well. Um, yeah, so he says some countries such as South Korea have been able to develop because they have had a cultural stream that flowed against the culture of corruption. So that's where the education is to counter the corruption. But I'll go back. So the diaspora question for you both. And the other one was race. How uh, is the race dynamic we have here in this country? How is it impacting the conversations we're having about Cuba and Haiti? I'll just hop in on that last one if I can. Thank you very much. I want to say that in many ways, education is not lacking. <laughs> you might think that I'm harping on the sovereignty thing too much, but it is so important. If we look at what happened after the earthquake, there were so many Haitian intellectuals and they're brilliant people in Haiti. And they're also brilliant when they come here and they're doctors and social workers and professors and other things. It's better if they can stay there. But there was a program, for instance, to have ecotourism in the north of Haiti. Um, tourism experts in Haiti, the ecological minister planned this all out. There would be a reserve in the north of Haiti. But as I said, Haitians don't have sovereignty over their own country. And USAID decided, um, and ex-president Bill Clinton, who was the head of this thing called the Interim Haiti Reconstruction Commission, which basically could dictate to the Haitian president what should be done, or again, there's the threat that he'll be removed. They decided, no, we want jobs. What are jobs? South Korea has been invoked. Let's give Haitians jobs from the South Korean garment manufacturer. So exactly where they were going to have this ecological preserve and where Haitians had been farmers growing food for themselves, we forced this big polluting factory from SAE to be plucked there, displacing the farmers and polluting the area where the environmental minister had planned that there would be this ecological preserve. And so again, there is a lot of brain power in Haiti, but we've not been supporting it 
because we've had these paradigms that suggest that foreigners need to tell them what to do or they're not educated. So again, that is just one example I could give many. There's a film by Raoul Peck called Fatal Assistance, which I think is really excellent and shows some of these things. I'll say quickly on the diaspora, the Haitian diaspora is very interested in what happens in Haiti. You've had protests all this year trying again as Haitian Americans to help our government understand that supporting the PHTK was not a good idea. The diaspora is, is rec, um, represented also on this commission and it can definitely play a role um, if we're listening to them. I'll stop there and let Michael answer the other. Uh, sure. Um, uh, let me take the diaspora one first just to finish the thought on that question with the, the Cuba side of it. Um, the Cuban diaspora in the United States is 2 million or so strong. Um, it's also a global diaspora, you know, particularly in the last 20, 30 years, Cubans don't only head to the United States, there's Cubans everywhere, there's Cubans in Moscow, <laughs> you know, there's an old Cuban joke about a Cuban in Alaska. Um, uh, you know, so I think of that when I think of Cubans in Moscow. Um, in the United States, the diaspora plays lots of role, you know, is obviously interested in what happens in Cuba, follows it closely. I think it's safe to say that, you know, there are degrees of separation and influence. It's not the same to be a Cuban American, unless you're a crazy person like me of the second generation, you know, you probably aren't following day to day events in Cuba, you know, sort of in the way that I am, because it's my job, right, versus if you kind of just, you know, immigrated five years ago, and still half of your family is there, right. So, so there are those, those, those differences. Um, there have also been differences of, of political opinion, differences of opinion with respect to what US Cuba policy should be. Those have gone through ups and downs. You can sort of splice the polling generation, migrant cohorts in all kinds of ways. What I would say is that over the last 10, 15 years, um, I think the Cuban diaspora has become increasingly critical to the Cuban economy, right? The, the reliance of the Cuban economy on remittances, something that was facilitated and opened by liberalization of US Cuba policy under Obama. Um, you know, remittances uh, earnings started to rival earnings from tourism as, as sort of part of Cuba's GDP. And that is really important. So it shows a community that's willing to support its loved ones, but it also breeds resentment because people start to ask after a while, and this is what they're asking now, and why there's a shift back again to support for more hardline sanctions policies in places like Miami. Why should I have to send $100 a month to my grandmother who worked her whole life and is earning a, a pension from the state that now is worthless, right? And this gets to the, that question of strict state capacity that I talked about. Um, so those ties are important. They're, they're become more transnational. Um, you know, Information technology has facilitated a lot of that. It's no longer the case that what happens in Cuba is kind of like this black box that you can't really figure out because it's the Cold War, right? People, people know and they follow it quite closely. Uh, the other thing I would say about the Cuban diaspora is that I, I think right now in the wake of these protests, there does appear to be this kind of coalescence. Everybody wants to support these protesters. I think everybody is runs the risk of imposing their own meanings on what the protesters are asking for. I've already referenced some real differences of opinion to the extent that US elected officials, many of whom are Cuban American, which speaks to Cuban Americans importance in the US political system are, let's face it, using this as, a, as an opportunity also in a domestic political context, right? It, it's, 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 you know, US Cuba policy is US domestic politics. That, that's distressing. And I think, uh, you know, risks making this more about those interests than about what's happening on the ground. And, and, that's, and that's a problem. Um, but the diaspora is very, very important. Um, with respect to the question on race, Difficult to answer this in 30 seconds, um, much less a couple minutes. Uh, what I would say is that there is a long history of race affecting directly and indirectly the contour of various aspects of the relationship between the United States and Cuba and the United States and Haiti. One example I would point to is immigration policy, right? Um, it is, you know, coming out of that Cold War context that Alyssa mentioned in the 1960s, you know, the United States did a lot to facilitate the entrance of Cuban migrants who were deemed to be fleeing communism, right? They provided them aid, they provided them an act, a, a, a ready path to legal immigration status that was simply not provided to Haitians who at the very same moment were fleeing uh, uh, an oppressive authoritarian government under the first Duvalier who was backed by the United States, right? And so there's been this, uh, and I think to not see a racial dynamic in that is to again be the ostrich with our head, with our head in the sands. 
particularly when we think of the fact that those Cubans who were coming in the early 1960s and still to this day, to some degree, have tended to be uh, lighter in complexion, shall we say, which is a reflection of sort of socioeconomic inequalities that track with race in Cuba in the sort of similar ways that they do in the United States. So that is still an issue. What I think is unique about this moment is that again, a lot of these people who were on the streets in, in Havana two weeks ago are Cubans of color. Uh, that represent, you know, these are the people for whom the revolution was fought. And that presents a new kind of challenge to the Cuban government that I don't think they figured out how to handle, but it also presents the risk that voices in Miami will instrumentalize that without doing a little bit of what, you know, old Marxists would call autocritica or self-critique, which, you know, we, we flash back to a year ago and some of the discourses that were coming out of parts of the Cuban American community vis-a-vis -vis Black Lives Matter, for example, demonizing it as nothing but a communist conspiracy and now to have folks in the streets in Cuba who are of color and to, you know, so there, there's, there's, there's some contradictions and some disconnects there that I think are worth, are worth keeping in mind. Thank you both. Um, we have actually gone over our one hour, which is absolutely fantastic. There are a number of questions that I, I don't think we got to and some clarifications on education to uh, counter the culture of corruption. But I, what I will say is this has been really a rich uh, exchange and I hope uh, everyone who has attended got something out of this. We thank you for your uh, attendance and support to FPRI and uh, remind you, as Raleigh said at the beginning, uh, this is provided free for anyone to attend, but anyone uh, who is willing to support FPRI, it is greatly appreciated. So we continue, can continue to bring experts to you to discuss uh, these sorts of foreign policy issues. So thank you. Alyssa, thank you, Michael, thank you, Raleigh, and thank you especially to our, part our attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Barbara.